My all-time favorite alien-human contact case would, without a doubt, be the 1956 friendship case of Pescara, Italy, more commonly known as the W-56. The aliens refer to themselves as the Acri. The Acri were not a single race, but rather a coalition of alien races, all of which were remarkably human in appearance. The term friendship referred to an alliance between the Acri and their human contactees. No aspect of it has ever been debunked, and it's widely regarded as being amongst the most credible and compelling cases of its kind. A couple years ago, I covered this case in a video titled Aliens Among Us. Toward the end of that video, I mentioned that there had been a few reports of friendship activity in other parts of the world as well. The topic for this video is one of such cases. This friendship case comes from South America, and while it shares many things in common with the Pescara case, there are quite a few significant perplexing differences, from claims of miraculous healings and fulfilled prophecies, to reports of a mysterious island and allegations of possible Nazi involvement. It's amongst the most intriguing and controversial cases in Chilean ufology. I am Lamont from Lamont at Large. And I'm Drew from Mad Cat Mysteries. Join us as we delve deep into the strange saga of the Chilean friendship case. Let's begin. Our story begins with a man named Ernesto de la Fuente. De la Fuente was a Chilean director and documentary filmmaker. After retiring in the 1980s, he kept busy with his hobby of being an amateur radio operator. It's important to note that certain elements about this case differ from one source to another. While skeptics are right to bring this up, we have to keep in mind that everything we know about this case has been translated from Spanish to English. When researching this case, it becomes quickly apparent that much of the available information has, for whatever reason, been very poorly translated. This, in my opinion, can account for at least some of the inconsistencies I encountered while researching this case. According to most sources, CB radio was the means by which De La Fuente made first contact with the people who identified themselves as belonging to friendship. He initially suspected them to be Mormons or belong to some other benign esoteric religious group. They claimed to be the inhabitants of a remote island somewhere in the Chacao Channel of southern Chile. This island would come to be known as Friendship Island. Radio communications between De La Fuente and the Friendship Group became a fairly regular event. These conversations would often go on for several hours at a time, and other CB operators from near and far would frequently join in the discussions. Eventually, De La Fuente met with a man who belonged to the mysterious Friendship Congregation. The man appeared to be somewhere between 35 and 55 years of age, and was significantly taller than the average Chilean. The unnamed man was described as having characteristically Nordic features, with dark blonde hair and lightly colored eyes. According to De La Fuente, the most striking thing about this man was the peace that radiated from his presence. Now, I find this description to be particularly interesting because it is incredibly reminiscent to the way in which the W-56 in the uh, Pescara friendship case were described. Those Acri were described as radiating peace, love, and wisdom. Another similarity between these two cases is that in both the Chilean case and the Pescara friendship case, the Acri were apparently fond of using the radio to communicate with their human friends on Earth. In time, he would go on to meet other members of the friendship group as well. He would describe each one as having eerily similar characteristics to the first one he met, almost as if they had been cut from the same mold. Each of them seemed to possess great wisdom and radiated a strong sense of love and peace. So here we have one pretty stark contrast in the description between the Pescara friendship members and the Chilean friendship members. In the Pescara friendship case, the Acri were all different heights. Some of them were extremely tall, some of them were extremely short, whereas some of them were apparently uh, roughly what we would consider to be a normal human height. Now, in the Chilean case, he, those were his words, by the way, cut from the same mold. That description leads me to think that maybe they were all about the same height. I mean, that's how I interpret it, at least. What exactly does that mean? 
Does it necessarily mean that the Pescara friendship case is not connected in any way to the alleged Chilean friendship case? I don't think that necessarily needs to be the case. With respect to the Pescara case, the ones that were of regular human height, well, I've heard a lot of people speculate that that particular group could have been Pleiadians. Actually, I've heard a lot of people suggest that they suspect Pleiadians were one of the members that make up the Acre as a whole. With the Chilean case, it all appears to be the same group. So maybe these are all Pleiadians in the Chilean case, or I don't know, maybe it's all a hoax. I really have no idea either way, but it's certainly something fascinating to ponder upon. The next individual we'll be discussing is an enigmatic boat captain named Alberto. Again, details about how Ernesto de la Fuente and Alberto met are a bit fuzzy, but sources do agree that Alberto was a captain of the ship called the Matilius II. Burdened by financial troubles, Alberto was desperate to take any job he can get. As fate would have it, members of Friendship informed de la Fuente that they were in need of an experienced captain with a suitable vessel. De La Fuente arranged a meeting between the two parties and Alberto was offered the job. Alberto assumed the job was some sort of illicit smuggling operation, so he didn't ask many questions. He was just happy to have a steady source of income. He was also initially under the impression that friendship was nothing more than a group of gringos, a Spanish word which loosely translate as foreigners. Shortly thereafter, Alberto and his vessel were taken to Friendship Island. It was here that, according to Alberto, the Midalus II was outfitted with all kinds of strange technological devices that were unfamiliar to him. Strange, highly advanced technologies were reportedly seen everywhere on the island as well. According to individuals claiming to have been healed on the island, the use of strange technology is frequently referenced and assumed to have played some role in the reported healings. Many of these claims involve the incorporation of what seems to be a spiritual aspect to their healings via the laying on of hands. I'm intrigued by how these healings are described as being both spiritual and technological in nature. It's interesting because this is very similar to the manner in which the nature of the inhabitants of Friendship Island were described, i.e. being both very technologically advanced and spiritually advanced beyond our understanding. We'll go deeper into the various claims of alleged healings in a subsequent video, but real quick, I'd like to interject something interesting I came across as I was editing this video. So I was doing an image search for Friendship Island on Google Earth, and this was one of the images that came back in the results. Whoever took the screenshot noticed a bright, luminescent orb right off the coast of the island and brought up the possibility of it being a UFO. If it is a bona fide UFO, then, well, that would be pretty interesting. After all, it wouldn't be the first time that a UFO was captured in satellite imagery. It's also very similar to other orb-type UFOs, like the one seen here, which was allegedly photographed in the same general area. There's a narrow but noticeable band of blue and violet hues around the perimeter of the orb spotted on Google Earth. This apparent fringing effect leads me to doubt that this could be explained as the result of a hot pixel from the Landsat camera. I plan on reaching out to Bruce Maccabee to see if he can shed some light on whatever this orb actually is. Dr. Maccabee is a highly respected optical physicist who also has a particular interest in the UFO phenomenon. If anyone can provide a valid, natural explanation, then it would be him. But let's consider the possibility that this orb is truly unexplainable. If that's the case, then its proximity to the island becomes all the more intriguing. Even so, it wouldn't necessarily prove that this island is Friendship Island. It should be viewed as nothing more than a possible indication, a puzzle piece which may or may not fit into the overall puzzle of Friendship Island. The Chilean coast has long been considered a major hotspot for UFO sightings. 
Local fishermen claim that sightings are so frequent that they happen on a weekly basis. Just like these men, Alberto was quite accustomed to frequent UFO sightings. But despite the myriad of strange technologies on Friendship Island and the peculiar nature of the island's residents, he did not believe that Friendship was in any way connected to the strange aircraft commonly seen in the skies above. According to respected Fortean researcher Micah Hanks, this would all change one day after a bombshell confession. Reportedly, members of Friendship confided to Alberto that they were, in fact, associated with the UFOs being seen in the area. If true, does this mean they originated from another planet? If so, how were they obtaining the currency to pay Alberto? According to a South American ufologist who extensively researched this case, the funds were coming from a North American nonprofit. Rodrigo Fuenzalita claims to have learned this during his investigation at Kimchi's Port, the site where the Midalist II would reportedly dock for its various transactions. The name of this American nonprofit, according to Fuenzalita, was the Mind Science Foundation. After some doing some digging of my own, I found the physical address of the Mind Science Foundation. Located in San Antonio, Texas, the organization is a think tank with the express goal of unlocking the secrets of human consciousness. It's easy enough, at least for me, to see why such an organization might be interested in friendship, considering as it is often described as consisting of borderline supernatural beings, both technologically and spiritually advanced beyond our understanding. Could their alleged interest have anything to do with reports of friendship having accurately predicted future events? Though specific details are hard to come by, it's said that friendship foresaw several tragic events. Such examples include numerous earthquakes and other natural disasters, as well as the 1986 explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger. The accurate prediction of future events shows up in another, suspected, friendship case. One of the suspected human contactees in this case was a well-known historical figure by the name of Voltaire. A handwritten letter allegedly written by Voltaire on the 6th of June, 1761, makes reference to the friendship he had with someone who possessed a wonderful flying machine. In a cryptic manner, one part arguably predicts the atrocities and worldwide wars during the middle of the 20th century. It also makes a very clear reference to the moving pictures in the 20th century. How would Voltaire, in 1761, have known about any of these things? Was he truly in contact with a member of Friendship? This letter is briefly discussed toward the end of a documentary about the Pescara Friendship case. A link to this documentary can be found in the description. While accurate predictions about future events have been associated with two different suspected Friendship cases, we can only speculate as to why the Mind Science Foundation was allegedly involved with the Chilean case. More importantly, are Fuenzalita's claims about the Foundation's involvement even true? I've yet to find any concrete evidence. For one, I need to know exactly who he got the information from. As I've yet to come across anything about the informant's identity, I plan to contact Fuenzalita with the hopes that a possible language barrier will not prove to be problematic. I thought it prudent to reach out to the Mind Science Foundation first, just to see what they had to say about their alleged involvement. This is a screenshot of the email I sent them. As you can see, the message was sent Saturday, December 7th, 2019. I'll keep everyone up to date and post their response if and when I receive it. Due to the complexity of this case, there's no way we can adequately cover it in one video. This is the end of part one. As I've gone completely cross-eyed researching this case, I'd like to cover a few other topics on my to-do list before tackling part two. Special thanks to PiperP34 for suggesting this topic, and special thanks to my buddy Lamont for doing this collaboration with me.